Welcome back. Um, this is the first video I've recorded in a while, and this is the video for the review of test one for fall 21. And I'm going to go over, first of all, all of the slide identification, and then um, and then some other parts of the test. So we're going to start, first video will probably be about 10 minutes in length, and we'll do slides one through seven. And I'm mostly not going to cover like the uh, the stuff that was already on the study guide sheet that you should be able to study for the works, but instead cover the other information uh, that you might be able to say. Remember that for every work in the slide identification, there are multiple things. Um, you have to put at least one piece of information about the work besides the title of the work, the attribution, and, um, and the date, remembering that attribution can be pretty um, pretty general, especially when we don't know the specific name of the artist, and that date can also be general. I give you a pretty wide uh, range depending on how old the work is. So in this case, because it is um, just at 3,000 years uh, BCE, it has to be w accurate within approximately 100 years on either side of uh, 3,100 BCE. And uh, so anyway, so for the Pal of Namur, what are some of the things you could say? The first thing that you probably should remember is that it's a work of sculpture and that it is a relief sculpture, low relief sculpture. Um, if you get each of those, there's points in there. Also, you might remember from the name that it is a pallet and that we're pretty confident that it was at least at one point used as a funerary pallet. We do have evidence that like in here that we have um, makeup that was being mixed. We also has, have evidence that at some point it might have been used as part of a, of a standard, like something that would have been held on a pole. Uh, so those are also two other interesting in pieces of information. And so it is named after Namer, who is a pharaoh or a, a king of Egypt that may or may not have existed. We're not uh, totally sure. Um, but at least it names him as Namer and names Namer as the person who united um, Upper and Lower Egypt. And so we see evidence of the unification of Upper and Lower Egypt. Um, probably the most important part is that he's wearing um, the crown of just one part of Egypt, one place, and then of the other part of Egypt. And I feel like, i not sure if I can find it, there's a spot where he's wearing the unified crown. Uh, but maybe not. Maybe it's just that he's wearing part of upper and one part and part of lower uh, in the other part. So that's a number of different things that you could say about this um, one piece. You might also happen to know that these bull heads are of the goddess Hathor. Um, and, oh, another thing that we just recently covered was the use of hierarchical scale in this, in that it's a really good example of that, of where scale change is on is on the piece to describe change of importance. So things are small when they're of less importance, and then they are large when they are things like, let's say, Namer himself, when they are of you know extreme importance. Okay, on to the next slide. So um, the Victory Stele of Naram Sin, and. So most important information um, that you might be able to remember about this piece, probably the most important one, is that it's also an example of relief sculpture. In this case, it is, um, I would say, technically high relief based on the amount of carving that is done around the forms, but it's really kind of a judgment call. It's somewhere in a kind of halfway between high and low relief type carving. It doesn't come very far out from the, the the face of the stone, but it is, as, like I said, it is kind of relatively deeply carved around the back side of most forms. So uh, you could, probably the best case to say is that it's about halfway between being high relief and low relief. And also another good example of hierarchical scale because of the way Naram Sin is depicted as really large and then his soldiers are larger than the people that they have defeated. And, um, trying to think what else. Uh, and you could also discuss how, like, in the memorial impulse, like many works of memorial art, it is erected, it was made to memorialize a military victory. 
And um, you might also remember that Naram Sin was the grandson of Sargon of Akkad, the founder of the Akkadian Empire. And uh, that's probably about it. Okay, uh, the bust of Queen Nefertiti. So let's see, what are some of the things that we know about the piece? Number one, um, don't forget this piece of information, the fact that it is um, limestone, carved limestone, but then with stucco, which is a clay, uh, clay and then painted um, on top of the stucco. So it is both an example of reductive sculpture and additive in that the, the underlying piece is made out of stone and was carved, but then on top of that, that would have been molded around the form and worked more additively. Um, it is a form of freestanding sculpture, and yeah, I would say freestanding, but not necessarily particularly in the round. And it is a portrait of um, Queen Nefertiti, who was the wife of um, Akhenaten, the pharaoh who is famous for the uh, Amarna Revolution or the Amarna period. And the other thing that we talked about was how um, this is rather unusual for Egyptian art and for ancient world in general because it comes very close to portraiture and the reasons why we feel it comes close to portraiture. It was found in a, um, in a sculptor studio rather than found out, you know, being used publicly. And the, the primary theory of this is that this piece was made to be kind of like a model that the sculptors would study. So the reason why it is so close to being a, a portrait of Nefertiti is because they were using it basically like a snapshot, like a resource photography, to then make you know, more formal, less specific, less portrait-like versions of her for, for the public to be used um, out in the public display. And so, but because they wanted to make it be a close representation, they wanted something very kind of detailed and specific and portrait-like in their studio to look at. So it's instead of having to ask the, the Pharaoh's wife to come in, you know, every, every couple of days to sit for another portrait. Okay, next one. So once again, more about sculpture. So in this case, uh, we're talking about um, relief sculpture again, low relief sculpture. And that was the main thing that we've talked about with this piece. We did also, by the way, you could get points just simply for remembering that it um, was found at the Palace of Ashurbanipal in Nineveh. It currently is at the um, British Museum if, and um, it is carved limestone. So there's all possible material that you could have there. So it's a form of reductive sculpture and it's a form of low relief sculpture. And the other thing we talked about was how in the Palace of Ashurbanipal, there were these long hallways um, and these long friezes along these hallways. And the two main themes of these friezes were, and a frieze is basically a continuous long uh, relief sculpture. And the two main themes of these friezes were um, Ashurbanipal at war and Ashurbanipal hunting lions. And so these are two themes that are, are used to represent both kind of the fearsome power of the king, Ashurbanipal, and also to kind of like represent him doing his kingly duty. These are the jobs that kings are expected to do, to fight the enemies of the people and to hunt lions. And um, we'll talk more about this piece later, uh, so we'll have more to say. But uh, that's, that's quite a bit right there. So um, the Achilles and Ajax Amphora by Ezekius. And this is the most famous example um, of black figure pottery that we talk about. And in this particular case, it's black figure pottery and it has an extreme amount of this kind of uh, scraffito uh, line work. Like black figure pottery, the, the line work, the kind of interior drawing of the figures is done by scratching away the black slip rather than with a with a brush with a dark line. So it's a light line that does all the interior drawing. And you can see that in this particular case is one of these examples where the artist, Ezekius, um, just put a huge amount of time and work into um, scratching away all these really um, intricate, detailed patterns. 
So we talked about it from that point of view. We also talked about it in the lecture about narrative in art, and we talked about how um, the importance of representation of mythology in narrative works of art, how mythology is a very specific kind of narrative, and that it's narrative that both has religious meanings, but also cultural, cultural identity meanings. Like in this particular case, this is an, a story of a particular narrative that very much kind of sums up a kind of an ideal about uh, Greek manhood. Um, and you might also remember the actual story, which is that here we have these two heroes, Achilles and Ajax, and they're playing a gambling game, a game of of dice um, ahead of a major battle. So it's to represent this idea of, you know, these, you know, Greek, you know, ideal men, these warriors um, kind of facing death in a way of like, you know, without a, a lot of over concern. And anything else? It is an amphora, right? Although we don't see the full image, but, um, and you might mention what an amphora is. Um, you could get points for that. Okay, and just in case you don't remember what an amphora is, we can define an amphora as a Greek vessel primarily for holding um, wine and sometimes for holding oil. Um, types of amphora, it's also used as a prize for athletic games like a Panhellenic amphora. And some of the basic structure of it is narrow uh, feet, uh, a narrow neck, wide shoulders, and then uh, two handles and the handles go from the wide shoulders to the, the lip, um, and the lip is usually relatively small too, um, or the mouth of the, uh, of the pot. Okay, anyway, here we have the Parthenon, and um, so let's see, what are some of the things that we learned about the Parthenon? Number one, we learned that it's an example of Doric architecture, so it's Greek Doric architecture, it's a temple, it's a, a temple dedicated to Athena, but it is not um, titled the Temple of Athena. Uh, it is um, the, often, sometimes it's referred to as the Temple Athena Parthenos, right? The Parthenon um, means of the maidens, and that has to do with a particular mythology um, having to do with the, the founding story of Athens, but also the fact that um, may, you know young women of um, leading families were essentially given to the temple to serve as priestesses in the temple. That was a major part of the, the role of the temple. And let's see, as a Doric temple, you can see that it has a triglyph and metope um, outside frieze here. You can also see uh, one of the things we talked about just recently in the architecture lecture was about how the importance, and especially in Doric architecture, but the importance in the ancient world of architecture demonstrating how it holds weight. And we can see that in the intasis, the swelling of the columns. We can see that in the spacing of the columns, the way they're more openly spaced in the middle and more tightly spaced at the corners. And also we can see that in that slight lean that we talked about, the way the columns aren't perfectly vertical, but lean in towards the center of the building just very, very slightly. And all of that is there to demonstrate how the building holds its weight. Okay, here's a number seven. So this is the last one. And um, so we have uh, Donatello's David. Uh, there are th Now, some people have on the, on the test said there were three Davids. Well, there are three main Davids that we have studied, but there are hundreds of different David works of art, hundreds of different paintings and sculptures of David, probably thousands, you know, just thinking about thousands, just in th terms of thinking about the Renaissance and the Baroque. But the three main that we studied was Donatello's David, Michelangelo's David, and Bernini's David. Anyway, getting back. So uh, what are some of the things that we could say about this particular one? It's cast bronze, which means it's in the form of indirect sculpture rather than additive or reductive. Um, it's a great example of contrapposto. Notice the way um, David is standing with the hips and shoulders counterbalanced to each other. And it is in the round, and it's so it's freestanding and fully in the round. And um, you might also mention that David is standing with his, his feet on the head of Goliath. And that's about it. Okay, so I'll do uh, slides eight through 10, and then also the, um, the five slide reaction 
ones uh, next. And okay, I'll see you then.